Hello everybody and welcome to Wine Library TV. I'm your host, Gary Vaynerchuk. So, um, I had a big plan for big name wines today and I'm definitely going to do that. But obviously, right before I taped, a flurry of comments in the last couple episodes. And uh, at this point, I don't think I can really kind of avoid it or get in there or jump into it. And so I'm going to have to tackle it straight ahead. Um, there's a lot of talk in the last couple comments about whether I'm promoting or giving good scores to wines that we want to sell or we're, we're making big money on or what have you. Let me uh, give you a quick, you know, I don't want to bog down the show with this, but I think it needs to be addressed because when your credibility is being, you know, questioned, you want to address it. And I'm not upset or angry at anybody because I totally understand. I am not confused that I wear two hats, but let's attack a couple issues. Issue number one, knock on wood, wine library and winelibrary.com and wine library, the business is doing extremely well and, uh, and, uh, and I don't know if I need to put myself out there to sell a couple of boxes. Number two, our email service, which hopefully you're a part of, sells 85,000 times more wine than Wine Library TV. I'm glad Wine Library TV is growing and we do see residual sales, but the impact is just so minimal. As a matter of fact, if I added up, and I haven't done this, but if I did and added up what I could conceive as the sales from Wine Library TV, I'm sure there's many zeros after the first decimal point in the percentage of sales for Wine Library. Number three, let's talk about Corte Riva because that's one of the topics. We had three lousy cases in stock when we did that episode. I wasn't sure if I was going to love it as much as I always have, but I thought it was a platform to, it's a wine I believe in. And most importantly, while I'm on that topic, every wine I score I believe in. But as you know, you know, I'm just one person's opinion. I'm not trying to impose my will on anybody. These are my thoughts, and which leads me really to point number four. I've accomplished a lot of things in my young age, and I felt that I needed a new challenge. And more importantly, I was bored. I missed my customers. My career at Wine Library started by being on the floor every hour that the store was open from my early 20s. Every hour. I knew every customer and I knew everything about them. I knew their tastes, their wants, their needs. I love them. There's, you know, I love people. I think you can tell that. And most importantly, when I walked down on a Saturday in late December and didn't know any of the 600,000 people that were in the store, I said to myself, I'm losing it. I will not do this. This is not what I said I was going to do in my career. I don't want to lose the touch. And the interaction is what I feed on. Do you honestly think in my 16 hour day that I need to answer all these emails and get all these questions and get involved in all this Wine Library TV production. I really don't. It's good for business and I like to do something new, but it's a need, a fundamental need in my heart to interact with people, be involved with people, and more importantly, it's fun. I mean, somebody said, how do I pick the wines? Let me tell you what I don't do. I don't run a database and run a gross profit margin report and figure out which wines are best to show on Wine Library TV. What I do is I go downstairs and for the only time in my life that I've ever been able to create this atmosphere, I'm a wine customer. I love wine. I love being a customer. It's probably why I'm a successful businessman. I understand those kind of things. And it's fun. I like walking through the aisles of my shop and checking out things. Most importantly, I always mention that there's other places to buy these wines. So many people can't get the wine that we have because we have 11, 12 states we can't ship to. And more importantly, some people, you know, can get these wines right across the street. Convenience is going to always beat Wine Library TV as a selling tool. I'm doing this because I love it. I hope you're loving it. The interaction is why I'm doing it. I mean, the interaction that I'm getting from all you guys, the Brandon M's, the J's, the Camera P's, the Tony's, everybody's going to be upset at me now. I just did a couple that popped in mind. I love all of you. I know a lot about a lot of you now. The interaction's amazing. I can't wait for the Wine Library TV tasting parties. And I promise you, and this is the final point I'm going to leave with you, Wine Library TV has hurt Wine Library's business from a political and behind-the-scenes standpoint. I have bashed wines wines that are very important to us, wines with people that I've done business with my entire life since I was 15 years old, wines that my father has done business with for 30 plus years. I've bashed and given poor scores to big brands with big scores, Chachi Brunello, Rosemount, you know, tons of import Los Boscos. I've felt enormous amounts of political pressure behind the scenes that you guys know nothing about, and I've lost out on allocations of wines that we could sell in one second and make more money than every one of the wines that we sell on Wine Library TV. It's been a very interesting road behind the scenes for me, and it's been a big challenge. I mean, most people understand on that side that they know who I am. And I think if you knew who I was, some of you that are wondering, 
you would really, really know where I'm coming from. And most importantly, I just want you to know one thing. I'm a man that stands behind my word. My word is bond. It's everything I've got. My father taught me that. I come from a first-generation European household. It's everything to me. And if I sat here and lied, I can't hide behind the written word like all the wine spectator and Robert Parker and Tanzer. You may not even know what they look like on the street. I'm too scared to rate something wrong or you know, to deceive somebody. I might get punched or shot or kicked in New York City as I'm walking around. I'm doing this for my heart. I hope you enjoy it. I've wasted way too much time, but I just really felt like I should tackle it. And that gets me into a very controversial episode episode. It's really ironic that this is what was lined up today when I decided to do this, but we are doing big name wines and let's get right into them because boy, do I know how to ramble and I apologize. Luna de Luna, new label, you know, and by the way, I don't like it at all. I like the old chick on the label. That was pretty cool. Lady, girl, woman, sorry, not offensive in any way. Anyway, Luna de Luna, six bucks, seven bucks, seven fifty, Chardonnay, 70%. Pinot Grigio, 30%. I'm doing big name wines today. Wines that you can find in any store that you don't have to buy from the wine library or anywhere else. Costco, Walmart. You know, you can find these wines everywhere. These are the big names in the wine world. And let's see how they're doing. I'm real curious. Get a lot of requests for things like that. Luna de Luna's fruit is sourced from Venezia. Again, 70% Chardonnay, 30% uh, Pinot Grigio. This was the hot item before Yellowtail kind of came and stole its thunder. Um, I find it to have a, you know, some acidity. It's got a little light oak, um, a little bit of crisp apple flavor. It's not offensive in any shape or form. It's actually far superior to what I thought going in, and the preconceived notions are going to come in play on every one of these wines because these are big name wines. You know, it's crisp, it's right, it's a, you know, it's very one dimensional and it's not thought provoking and the flavor is one flavor, it's apple juice wine. But, um, but I can see scoring this wine 85 points, which is not atrocious in, in the scheme of things and for $7.50, you know, not bad at all. Nice work, Luna, I did not expect that at all. Mangoes. Anyway, let's move on. Kendall Jackson, 2005 Chardonnay. A wine library exclusive. You cannot get this wine anywhere else. Let's see what's going on. Boy, oh boy, KJ, the first wine I knew that sold like water. I mean, we sold 50 cases the first day I was in the store working when I was 14 years old. It was insanity. It's all people bought. $10. Classic KJ, tons of oak and butter, charred wood on the nose. Real, you know, real significant acidity on the finish. Doesn't finish clean at all. Um, you know, oak, butter, oak, butter. And you know what has? Has a little bit of oak and butter. And with that, we're going to score the KJ 83 points. And we're going to move on. Louis Jadot, Pouli Fousse, 2005. Great producer, about 16 bucks, 17 bucks on the Pouli Fousse. Um, Louis Jean, Pouli Fousse, if you don't know, 100% Chardonnay. Every time a customer comes into the store and says, can I get a great Pouli Fousse? And we say, no, oh, we don't have anything we really love, but we have some great Chards. And they say, no, I don't drink Chardonnay. We laugh, we smile, we all high five. It's our favorite moment. It happens three to five times a day. So, maybe you learned something with that. Nice light color, nothing too crazy. Heavy oak. Heavy oak, also very similar nose to the KJ, butter oak. Mm. Much more refined on the palate. Came with a much more crispness, cleanness. White burgundy, you know, you're not going to get all that oak and butter you get in California. I mean, it's got a nice medium body aspect to it. But the flavors are a little bit unbalanced. Um, I'm not feeling the finish either. I'm going to go uh, 85 points on this as well. Because it is nice wine. You know, it's definitely as good as the Luna de Luna, but not really much more. And for 17 bucks, when it comes to QPR, we might go with four Zs. All right. 
Forest Glen, 2004 Merlot. Forest Glen, big brand. I remember the day it launched. I remember the first day we got it. It was a $10 wine back then. Now it's only 7 for the Merlot. And let's see what it's showing. Let's see what Forest Glen is. California Appalachian. Wow, that smells bad. Um, you know that cheap wine smell. This has really got it, and that's unfortunate. Um, very herbaceous, very, um, what is that, smoky, smoky garbage. <laughs> Jeez. itself out of there a little bit. You know, how'd you like that on a shelf talker? Smoky garbage. Um, actually has solid fruit. This Merlot's not, not as bad as, yeah, the nose is far, far inferior to the body. Yeah, little candy strawberry, little nice acidity balance, good mid palate, finishes strong. This is a stunner. This is coming on quite a bit. I like the body and the flavor, and it's actually a nice little drink, especially for the money. Let's give this wine an 86, but considering it had a 39-point nose, that's a remarkable comeback. Nice shot for us, Glenn. And, and, you know, definitely if you're at, you know, one of those fast food, high-quality places out there in the country, what are the Applebee's, TJF Fridays, things of that nature around the country, Forest Glen is probably a wine that might be on the list, and this Merlot will not offend you with that burger. Let's move on. Mouton Cadet, 2003. 65% Merlot, 20% Cabernet, 15% Cab Franc. Mouton Cadet, along with Corvo Red, were the two biggest selling wines when I first got into the business in, in, in the mid-90s. They were just huge wines. $6.50, everybody who drank $10 range French red wines bought Mouton Cadet. It was a different world back then, and that was probably indicative of 99% of the retailers around the country. So, let's see. Nice, solid elegant kind of, you know, really nice, yeah, it's got almost like a spearmint kind of nose to it, which is a very awkward smell for a red wine, but it's definitely there. Little oaky, little, little cassis, little, uh, interesting Bordeaux nose, but classic Bordeaux nose. Light. This is made by the uh, Rothschild family behind the Mouton Rothschild. So they make $500 wines and they make $6 wines. Um, it actually showed okay. I was actually starting to enjoy it. The flavors are kind of nice. Nice little hint of cherry, you know, nice little aspect of, uh, you know, cassis. Really nice, normal Bordeaux flavors, but then it's extremely light. It's a very light bottle of wine. especially considering the grapes that are involved. Um, and there is a little hint of, of an awkward aftertaste. Let's score this wine, 84 points. You know, not for me. Maybe you like it. All right, Corvo Red. This is the Corvo Red, and this is from Sicily, mainly Nero de Tabla. This is 2003. And let's see what we got here. Eight bones on this bad boy. Not a great color. It smells like cheese. Or stinky feet or socks. Or sweaty sweatpants. Yeah. You know, funky nose. give the Corvo um, 78 points. Um, I pass on every level that fundamentally means anything about wine. All right. <laughs> After all that, we're going to get a nice treat here, hopefully. This is the 2002 Silver Oak Cabernet from Alexander Valley. Ironically, we're sold out of this. So Anyway, let's try it. 52 bones. 75 in most places, 110 on lists. Nice color. This is the Alexander Valley, not the Napa Valley. 
classic silver oak nose. I mean, classic. This is where I, you know, when we do the wine library TV tasting parties, we'll do blind. And so if anybody brings a silver oak, it's where I can really show my true merit because I could peg this every time. It is that creamy, milky oak flavor. Very few wines have this exact eucalyptus nose. This is silver oak every time. Um, whew. I should mention we are getting more cases, so I want to, you know, make that apparent. Um, I don't like this wine at all, actually. I, I actually am not a silver oak basher like many people are out there. There's the people that are like silver oak crazy. There's the people that hate silver oak. I just like the ones that I like and the ones that I don't like, I don't like. I thought I would like the O2 given the growing season. I actually don't. I find it a little disjointed. It's a little cream puffy. You know, it's kind of like, it's just not showing much structure. It's just pure fruit, muted fruit. I'm not, I'm not feeling it. And I'm going to have to score this 88 points. I'm really not feeling this wine, and I think it's a complete waste of money at $52. Anyway, lots to talk about in closing. Today is episode 99, and episode 100 is coming, but it won't be coming until next Wednesday. I know, you hate me right now, but I apologize. Tomorrow I'm going to D.C. on business. I won't be back until late Friday. Saturday, I have to go to my Father's Day gift to my father-in-law, Peter, so I won't be around and won't be able to do it then either. Sunday, come on, are you kidding me? J-E-T-S, Jets 31, that's right, Jets 31, Colts, the 3-0 Colts, 29. I'll be there. High five me. I'm going to go nuts. Monday is a very big Jewish holiday. I won't be in. And then Tuesday, we got to really get it to where we got to present it to you for Wednesday. I will try to do some blog entries, maybe a quick little video. I haven't decided. I'll keep you busy, but it won't be until next Wednesday. Finally, one other thing. Congratulations, Jay. Way to go. Your t-shirts are on the way. It was really cool how you got all those people to comment. I really appreciate it. The whole refer a friend thing on the wine library, seeing people saying, hey, Cameron P sent me here, or Jay, or Tim App, it's so cool. Please, get the word out, WLTV. You now know it's all about the viewers for me. So help me help you. More viewers, more pumped up Gary. More you know, crazy terminology, more fun. That's what we're about. Finally, this is Gary Vaynerchuk. It's just wine. Let's keep it simple.